So uh, hi, Mark. Uh, welcome to the, the interview. And thanks for joining me on this. No problem, Ken. Right. So just, just to be clear, although I'm the manager for marketing and school engagement at the Singapore campus of James Cook University, this is uh, done on a personal basis. So it's not sponsored, endorsed or approved by the university. Is that okay with you? Yep, that's perfectly fine with me. Okay, good. So maybe let's start off with a self-intro. Hand it over All to right. you. Yep, okay. Uh, my name is Mark. Uh, I'm, into, I'm in my second year of my three and a half year PhD, so it's a very long journey. So I've got one and a half years more to go. I say two and a half years more to go. <laughs> I've lost track of time, but basically I need to finish by 2023. So I was enrolled in uh, February last year, so that's February 2020. Then my, ex uh, my current research is about associative learning, specifically on learning across multiple contexts. So uh, my study consists of two concurrent parts one of which is looking at the efficacy of conducting extinction learning across multiple contexts via a systematic review and method analysis. The other is looking at mechanisms of original learning or acquisition of learning across multiple contexts, specifically how it affects subsequent secondary learning, or in this case, extinction learning, even if extinction learning was conducted across multiple contexts. So it's a bit confusing, I know, but the findings from these studies could hopefully one day guide clinical practice particularly for people with specific phobias, anxiety disorders, or even addictions. For instance, helping victims who have suffered trauma across multiple forms of contexts and environments. It's quite a, quite a very, uh, it's, it's more about teaching and academics. I no, no, no. Research. no, 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 okay. <laughs> Nothing to do with teaching and academics, it's more about learning. Learning. Uh, like how a person acquires a phobia, for example. I see, I see. Yeah, so it can lead to anxiety disorders for very severe and it can lead to trauma like uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, for example. Okay, okay. Yeah, so along those lines. Okay, so um, thanks for the intro and uh, clarification. <laughs> yeah. um, what, what, what I really wanted to hear from you today was about the HDR tutorship scheme. Maybe yes. you could share a little bit more about that. Okay, the nutshell, the, the scheme prioritizes HDRs, which is higher degree for research uh, individuals like us, to teach at JCUS, JCU Singapore. Uh, teaching in this context refers to the sessional tutorship roles under the guidance of the lecturer or senior lecturer here in JCUS. Hence, we, we assist the lecturer to uh, fulfill learning objectives for the module, for example, conducting lectures, consultations with students on their projects, conducting experiments, marking the performative assessments and providing detailed feedback for each student. Now, of course, the duties uh, for a tutor can vary across disciplines, but the general idea is there to assist the lecturer in fulfilling learning objectives. And classes can take place face-to-face -face or via online, online learning. So this is a useful starting point for budding academics or early career researchers like myself looking to cross into academia to really learn, practice, and fine tune what it takes to start a career in academia, specifically ones that involve a teaching track. However, there are some requirements that uh, interested applicants may have to take note of. For example, uh, applicants will have to complete first their first HDR milestone, which is the confirmation of candidature, which involves completing a literature review and presenting and defending their proposal in a seminar. Secondly, is applicants must hold a master's degree in the relevant field. And I also need to point out uh, to the viewers that, that there are some exclusions to this uh, due to regulatory requirements. And JCUS being listed as a private education institution or PEI, this scheme currently only applies to Singapore citizens, permanent residents, and holders of the relevant long term pass. Yep. Okay, so we say this is something like a TA role, a teaching assistant, or more towards yes. an adjunct independent teacher? Really? Uh, no, more a teaching assistant role. Okay. We are assisting the teacher directly. So the teacher or lecturer will be guiding us, assessing us, critiquing us, and basically with, uh, enabling us to one day hopefully take over the role as a lecturer. So it's more of a guiding process. Okay. Well, it's uh, uh, like a, sort of like an OJT to prepare you for a, a career in academia, so to speak? Yes, yes, more or less, yes. Okay. But of course, we have to be mindful that we are uh, tutoring students. So whatever, that's why we need to have a master's degree. We need to be knowledgeable and comfortable in the roles that we are tutoring as well. So there are some limitations to this scheme. We, not just anybody can teach anything that they want. There are some checks and balances in place. Okay. 
All oh, right. So uh, I understand that you were the one who came up with this initiative personally. Uh, okay. My pockets and my bank accounts collectively came up with the idea. <laughs> but uh, important disclaimer here, I did not invent this idea. This idea is not novel. If you look around, numerous universities around the world have already established uh, such a system in place a very long time ago. Therefore, I realized that the absence of such a scheme here places graduates at a great disadvantage because compared to other I mean, especially when you compare to other universities, both in Singapore and worldwide. Uh, many other institutions make it a requirement for PhDs to actually teach in order to graduate, or at the very least provide candidates with opportunities to engage in teaching activities to earn experience and an income. Thus, previously, upon graduation, we will have to compete with fellow peers with the same qualifications, but not an experience that puts us in a very distinct disadvantage. Therefore, this approval and implementation of this scheme at JCUS puts us more or less on a level playing field, so that's a good start. Kind of reminds me of those memes uh... Uh, there's, there's this one with the uh, little kids at the construction site wearing the safety vest and the safety helmet. Then the caption is, uh, um, when the entry-level job requires 10 years of relevant work experience. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah. it's a chicken-egg issue. Yep. Chicken-egg issue, yeah. So I, I think it's a very good thing and uh, it's great that as a, a PhD candidate, a HDR candidate, you yourself took the initiative to actually recommend it to um, the relevant people in the, in the university to actually get it pushed through. Yeah. So I, I saw from the correspondences that actually you were the one leading this uh, initiative and uh, speaking to the relevant people to get it approved. Yes. Was it done solely on your own or do you have some help from the other HDR candidates? Uh, I did consult a few of the HDR candidates and they're all in agreement that uh, having such a scheme would be advantageous to all current uh, PhD candidates as well as upcoming potential uh, candidates as well. So this is this is not just, uh, the idea was, I mean, the consultation was done by a few PhDs, but the idea was presented by myself to the to the board because uh, I need, so need to point out that I'm the HDR rep for JCUF ah, as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, right. So, so it's mm. actually quite nice to see that it's like, you know, kind of like uh, all the students or the candidates by the candidates. Uh, so it's a very, very nice groundwork initiative from Led yes. by you. So that's that's great. That's great. So um I mentioned it wasn't uh it wasn't it's not a, a groundbreaking idea, it just basically took something right. that implemented elsewhere. It is not a novel idea at all. It's just something that we found that there's a gap, there's a need. So we presented our idea to the respective uh, people in charge. Mm -hmm. So beyond the experience, right? Um, how do you think this will be beneficial to all the HDR candidates or PhD candidates? Okay, um, firstly, JCUS did not feature a formalized process for enrolled HDR to take on tutorship or teaching assistantship responsibilities. So as PhD graduates, generally gravitate towards a career in academia. Having no teaching experience upon graduation severely disadvantages the JCUS graduate, making them less attractive to uh, employing institutions. Therefore, having a scheme facilitates teaching opportunities for HDR candidates that greatly adds value to the candidate and matures the candidate's ability to conduct classes professionally upon graduation. So that's the first point. Secondly, and this involves communication skills and developing the confidence to talk, not just about anything, but particularly about scientific topics relevant to them, to a group of people. So often we have to share our results, say in conference proceedings, to our peers, to the general public be it via Zoom, post the presentation or a class presentation. Now, having the ability to confidently convey scientific information to a lay audience is beneficial and a much needed skill. Not only communicating verbally, but also gaining confidence through providing written feedback for student assessments. Now, the third point is that uh, universities generally prefer, as we spoke about it earlier, to recruit Lect universities generally prefer to recruit lecturers or tutors who hold a relevant PhD qualification to conduct lectures and tutorials. So that's why we mentioned earlier, a chicken egg issue for HDR candidates seeking to gain or expand their experience in teaching, but fall short of the desired qualification, especially when they are processed with external lecturers holding PhDs during a regular hiring procedure process. Therefore, having a formalized scheme where candidates are prioritized to take on tutorship or teaching assistantship responsibilities is essential. 
in ensuring that the candidate is provided ample opportunities to grow and develop teaching and communication skills. Uh, fourthly, fourth point, HDR candidates who are not on scholarship may also face difficulties financing the st their studies or their fees and or their daily subsistence. So three and a half years to complete a PhD is a long-term commitment and having no income increases that risk of being impacted by unforeseen personal or external circumstances that could severely impact our ability to pay or, or our overall financial resources. So this can result in higher deferment rates or of candidature or attrition rates. So income gained for, uh, by teaching in this scheme, while not guaranteed and based on availability, could potentially buffer or minimize the impact of extenuating circumstances that could adversely impact candidates' finances or at the very least provide some form of financial security for candidates and potential candidates who are considering mm -hmm. investing long-term with a PhD candidature here at JCUS. The fifth point, sorry, be long in there. Huh? <laughs> universities in Singapore have similar tutorship schemes. I mean, take for example, NUS, NTU, SMU. They are marketed to attract locals to take up a PhD. For instance, the NUS School of Computing, if you look at that official Facebook page, they advertise very loudly that candidates will be paid $6,000 a month to teach while pursuing a PhD on top of having their fees waived. Okay, but while the practicalities of following through with such uh, assurance is limited to select universities, the advertisement nevertheless is highly attractive, impactful, and arguably effective in securing talented locals in applying for a PhD there. So the absence of such a scheme places GCUS at an immediate disadvantage in attracting locals to consider enrolling for a PhD here. And implementing and marketing the, the, the scheme right here in GCUS US would be make it would definitely make it more attractive to locals as pursuing a, a full-time PhD could involve leaving their full-time jobs or experiencing a significant drop in income. Okay, the last point, don't worry, very last point. Uh, the benefits of being get, gainfully employed are well documented. Studies have shown that persons who remain employed enjoy access to income, social support networks, have a greater sense of contributory purpose to society, and enjoy elevated status and recognition. Furthermore, being employed is linked to better fulfillment of goals, objectives, which is beyond the self and is key to maintaining a personal identity. Now, look at it on the flip side, where a PhD candidate is not earning income throughout these three and a half years, for example. Now, unemployment could have profound psychological and social impacts. For example, being excluded from society could lead to fewer social support networks, lower self-esteem, greater restriction on finances, and poorer physical health outcomes. Moreover, unemployment could lead to poor mental health and be a potential barrier for future employment. For example, prolonged unemployment could lead to a sense of hopelessness you know, and low self-worth that may cause the individual to just give up, perhaps on a PhD or you know, on, on future job searches. So these are the mental stresses faced by PhDs, particularly those who do not have an income or are unemployed for prolonged periods of time. Hence, to sum up, having the opportunity to teach, to earn an income can go a long way towards sustaining favorable mental and physical health outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. You're already something like a lecturer. <laughs> on the way there, on the way there. Too much, too much. <laughs> All right. So actually there are two points I, I think they are quite interesting. Uh, the first one, the one you mentioned about uh, science communication. I, I think that's a very good thing to bring up, especially uh, when you mention science communication to the lay person. Yes. To lay people. Because I, I think when we read the... Uh, scientific papers or the journals, often they are hidden behind a paywall. So that's one, one, uh, one, one uh, limitation of, of how people can get the information. Yep. Then mm -hmm. second is, even you have access to it. I was just looking at that, uh, uh, a paper on economics recently. Then there was like matrices and everything. I <laughs> had, had no clue, tried to look at the summary also, kind of uh, figure out what I was trying to say, but it was actually quite quite difficult to 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 get the the, the gist of it. Yes, yes. So Even I, the abstract is difficult. Yeah. So I think yeah. being able to communicate to the lay person is actually quite important. Because I understand. I remember someone actually telling me once that um, when you write 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 article for a journal, you are you are writing for your peer. So it's being peer reviewed. So you are expert writing for another expert to review. Whereas. Yes. A lay person might come in and don't have don't, they don't have any of the expertise. 
Yeah. So I think that's why sometimes the science journalists and all these journalists um do do quite a good job of um to to put it bluntly dumbing it down for people like me who don't understand the, the papers. Like yeah, so but I guess if you as the you as the PhD candidate or eventually when you become a a graduate get the PhD, if you are able to do it yourself, I mean it's better to hear it from the source. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 difficult because even throughout the last uh, two years here, it, 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 I had, there are several instances where I have to uh, convert my my writing to a more lay friendly manner. It is difficult because when we use easier, not say easier, when we use different words to replace certain technical terms, the accuracy of that term diminishes. So if an expert comes and see my poster and they realize, hey, that's a wrong term, then I will be at a loss words because on one hand, I know the correct term to use, but on the other hand, I need to also cater for another demographic to read what I'm doing. Like, for example, when I was mentioning, when you asked me what I was doing earlier, the way I was describing my study was technically accurate, but it would have been difficult for anyone to really kick it up what I was trying to say, like the word context. What does it really mean? There are many forms of context. Environment is an easier way of saying it, but it's not technically correct. So yeah, that's just one example. Mm. And the, the other point I, I, I like that you brought up was about the teaching positions are actually, hey, just get experience only, uh, teach, for, teach for the experience, but don't get paid. So it's actually paid. Yes, yes, it, it has to be paid. <laughs> the amount of hours that, that that we have to put in, I mean, the preparation work, the creation of the slides, the teaching hours, the out of teaching hours, which is the marking consultation hours. I mean, if we're not paid for that, it will be a bit difficult to convince anyone to actually, you know, put on the amount of efforts on top of the current things that we are already doing. So, yes. Yep. And I totally agree about how um, having these kind of schemes were uh, make 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 the programs uh, make it more attractive for locals, especially to take up a, yeah. a PhD. I mean, if you are earning five six thousand a month, you are a manager somewhere, and you decide to take a PhD, suddenly you lose all the income. Right. Even if you're on a scholarship, I mean, your your fees are waived, but there's there's no there's no income coming, but your bills are still coming in. So all I right. So that leads to a lot of a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. Like I mentioned earlier, the yeah. degradation of your mental and physical health outcomes. Mm. It comes a reality. It is not easy from the side of being employed to actually perceive all this. But once you're in the position of a, of a long-term study, you start to feel all these effects. The bills are coming in. They will never stop. You will have to keep maintaining your, your lifestyle or decrease your lifestyle, but the bills still keep still keep coming. You still have to eat. Transportation is expensive. It used to be very cheap, but once you start stop, once you stop earning income, you realize that the, the sense that you spend just to travel from one spot to another spot actually adds up quite a lot significantly in a month. So small things like this become more apparent, and along with the mental stresses that comes with it as well. So having this scheme uh, really, really does make a difference. Yeah. Okay, so we've gone through all the benefits now. I'd like you to share a little bit more about what it was like working with the research dean office on getting this approved. Okay, working with the research dean office, working with the, with the research community was very seamless, painless, and quick. And I am not exaggerating. <laughs> For example, I have all the email documentation to back this up. The idea was presented during a research committee meeting, it's in a minute, on the 23rd of November, 2020. The approval date and when the scheme went live was 22nd December, 2020. Okay. So it literally took one month from the conception of idea, paper presentation to the executive management group of the ENG to the final approval. So it was, very, it was really very quick. Uh, of course, there's a lot of work behind the scenes by yours truly to ensure that the proposals are written in a convincing manner. Uh, but again, it was, it was really painless. Uh, I mean, before I presented the idea, I initially expected a lot of resistance, but instead, they have been and still are incredibly supportive of HDR and their initiatives. And therefore, I'd like to use this opportunity to thank the research committee for their most support, particularly for Professor Abhishek Bhatti, who is the campus dean, Dr. Denise Dillon, who is the associate dean for research and research education, and also Dr. Jonathan Ramsey, who is the academic head for social and health science here at JCUS. 
So this research committee meeting, is this on a monthly or weekly basis? It's, it's on a month. No, no, no. Weekly basis will kill me. It's on a, it's on a monthly basis. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So you just put it out at one of the regular monthly meetings and the following month, it yes. was approved already. Yes, of course, I, as I mentioned earlier, I consulted a few of my fellow HDRs and they all agreed it's a sensible idea. Then with their support and approval, I presented this idea to the committee. Yep. Okay, so I think um, that's pretty much all the questions I have. Do you have anything you want to say to the viewers? Uh, no, not, not at this moment. <laughs> but, uh, everything's good here. Uh, the, 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 the supervisor is very supportive. It's a good experience here at, at, at JCO so far. But just, just, just my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's about it for me. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for joining on this interview. No problem. Thank you so much, Kenneth, for giving me the opportunity to share about this particular scheme. Hey, thanks for watching till the end of the video. If you found value in this content, please help me out by liking the video. And if you haven't, please subscribe to the channel and turn on the notifications as well.